Dubliners by James Joyce The Sisters There was no hope for him this time. It was the third stroke. Night after night I had passed the house, it was vacation time, and studied the lighted square of window, and night after night I had found it lighted in the same way, faintly and evenly. If he was dead, I thought, I would see the reflection of candles on the darkened blind, for I knew that two candles must be set at the head of a corpse. He had often said to me, I am not long for this world, and I had thought his words idle. Now I knew they were true. Every night as I gazed up at the window, I said softly to myself the word paralysis. It had always sounded strangely in my ears, like the word gnomon in the Euclid, and every and the word simony in the Catechism. But now it sounded to me like the name of some maleficent and sinful being. It filled me with fear, and yet I longed to be nearer to it and to look upon its deadly work. Old Cotter was sitting at the fire, smoking, when I came downstairs to supper. While my aunt was ladling out my, uh, ladling out my stirabout, he said, as if returning to some former remark of his, No, I wouldn't say he was exactly, but there was something queer. There was something uncanny about him, I'll tell you my opinion. He began to puff at his pipe, no doubt arranging his opinion in his mind, tiresome old fool. When we first, uh, when we knew him first, he used to be rather interesting, talking of faints and worms, but I soon grew tired of him and his endless stories about the distillery. I have my own theory about it, he said. I think it was one of those peculiar cases, but it's hard to say. He began to puff again at his pipe without giving us his theory. My uncle saw me staring and said to me, Well, so your old friend is gone. You'll be sorry to hear. Who? said I. Father Flynn. Is he dead? Mr. Cotter here has just told us. He was passing by the house. I knew that I was under observation, so I continued eating as if the news had not interested me. My uncle explained to old Cotter, the youngster and he were great friends. The old chap taught him a great deal, mind you, and they say he had a great wish for him. God have mercy on his soul, said my aunt piously. Old Cotter looked at me for a while. I felt that his little beady black eyes were examining me, but I would not satisfy him by looking up from my plate. He returned to his pipe and finally spat rudely into the grate. I wouldn't like children of mine, he said, to have too much to say to a man like that. How do you mean, Mr. Cotter? asked my aunt. What I mean is, said old Cotter, it's bad for children. My idea is, let a young lad run about and play with young lads of his own age and not be... Am I right, Jack? That's my principle, too, said my uncle. Let him learn to box his corner. That's what I'm always saying to that Rosicution there. Take exercise. Why, when I was a nipper, every morning of my life I had a cold bath, winter and summer, and that's what stands to me now. Education is all very fine and large. Mr. Cotter might take a pick of that leg mutton. He added to my aunt. No, no, not for me, said old Cotter. My aunt brought the dish from the safe and put it on the table. But why do you think it's not good for children, Mr. Cotter? She asked. It's bad for children, said old Cotter, because their minds are so impressionable. When children see things like that, you know it has an effect. I crammed my mouth with a stirabout for fear I might give utterance to my anger, tiresome old red-nosed imbecile. It was late when I fell asleep. Though I was angry with old Cotter for alluding to me as a child, I puzzled my head to extract meaning from his unfinished sentences. 
In the dark of my room, I imagined that I saw again the heavy gray face of the paralytic. Paralytic. I drew the blankets over my head and tried to think of Christmas. But the gray face still followed me. It murmured, and I understood that it desired to confess something. I felt my soul receding into some pleasant and vicious region, and there again I found it waiting for me. It began to confess to me in a murmuring voice, and I wonder why it smiled continually, and why the lips were so moist with spittle. But then I remembered that it had died of paralysis, and I felt that I too was smiling feebly, as if to absolve the simoniac of his sin. The next morning, after breakfast, I went down to look at the little house in Great, uh, Great Britain Street. It was an unassuming shop, registered under the vague name of Drapery. The drapery consisted mainly of children's booties and umbrellas, and on ordinary days, a notice used to hang in the window... Uh, a notice used to hang in the window saying, Umbrellas Recovered. No notice was visible now, for the shutters were up. A crepe bouquet was tied to the door knocker with a ribbon. Two poor women and a telegram boy were reading the card pinned on the crepe. I also approached and read, July 1st, 1895. The Reverend James Flynn, formerly of St. Catherine's Church, Meath Street, aged 65 years, R.I.P. The reading of the card persuaded me that he was dead, and I was disturbed to find myself at check. Had he not been dead, I would have gone into the little dark room behind the shop to find him sitting in his armchair by the fire, nearly smothered in his great coat. Perhaps my aunt would have given me a packet of high toast for him, and this present would have roused him from his stupefied doze. It was always I who emptied the packet into his black snuff box, for his hands trembled too much to allow him to do much without spilling half the snuff about the floor. Even as he raised his large, trembling hand to his nose, little clouds of smoke dribbled through his fingers over the front of his coat. It may have been these constant showers of snuff which gave his ancient priestly garments their green-faded look for the red handkerchief, blackened as it always was, with the snuff stains of a week with which he tried to brush away the fallen grains, was quite inefficacious. I wished to go in and look at him, but I had not the courage to knock. I walked away slowly along the sunny side of the street, reading all the theatrical advertisements in the shop windows as I went. I found it strange that neither I nor the day seemed in a mourning mood, and I felt even annoyed at discovering in myself a sensation of freedom, as if I had been freed from something by his death. I wondered at this, for, as my uncle had said the night before, he had taught me a great deal. He had studied in the Irish college in Rome, and he had taught me to pronounce Latin properly. He had told me stories about the catacombs and about Napoleon Bonaparte, and he exp had explained to me the meaning of the different ceremonies of the Mass and of the different vestments worn by the priest. Sometimes he had amused himself by putting difficult questions to me, asking me what one should do in circum circumstances or whether such and such sins were mortal or venial or only imperfections. His questions showed me how complex and mysterious were certain institutions of the church, which I had always regarded as the simplest acts. The duties of the priest towards the Eucharist and towards the secrecy of the confessional seemed so grave to me that I wondered how anybody had ever found in himself the courage to undertake them. And I was not surprised when he told me that the fathers of the church had written books as thick as the post office directory and as closely printed as the law notices in the newspaper, elucidating all these intricate questions. Often, when I thought of this, I could make no answer or only a very foolish and halting one upon which he used to smile and nod his head twice or thrice. Sometimes he had used to put me uh, through the responses of the Mass 
which he had made me learn by heart. And as I pattered, he used to smile pensively and nod his head, now and then pushing huge pinches of snuff up each nostril alternately. When he smiled, he used to uncover his big, discolored teeth and let his tongue lie upon his lower lip, a habit which made me feel uneasy in the beginning of our acquaintance before I knew him well. As I walked along in the sun, I remember old Cotter's words and tried to remember what had happened afterwards in the dream. I remembered that I had noticed long velvet curtains and a swinging lamp of antique fashion. I felt that I had been very far away, in some land where the customs were strange, in Persia, I thought. But I could not remember the end of the dream. In the evening, my aunt took me with her to visit the house of mourning. It was after sunset, but the window panes of the houses that looked to the west reflected the tawny gold of a great bank of clouds. Nanny received us in the hall, and and as it would have been unseemly to have shouted at her, my aunt shook hands with her for all. The old woman pointed upwards inter interrogatively, interrogatively, and on my aunt's nodding proceeded to toil up the narrow staircase before us her bowed head being scarcely above the level of the banister rail. At the first landing, she stopped and beckoned us forward encouragingly towards the open door of the dead room. My aunt went in, and the old woman, seeing that I hesitated to enter, began to beckon to me again repeatedly with her hand. I went in on tiptoe. The room through the lace end of the blind was suffused with T dusky golden light, amid which the candles looked like pale, thin flames. He had been coffined. Nanny gave the lead, and we three knelt down at the foot of the bed. I pretended to pray, but I could not gather my thoughts, because the old woman's mutterings distracted me. I noticed how clumsily her skirt was hooked at the back, and how the heels of her cloth boots were trodden down all to one side. The fancy came to me that the old priest was smiling as he lay there in his coffin. But no. When we rose and went up to the head of the bed, I saw that he was not smiling. There he lay, solemn and copious, vested as for the altar, his large hands loosely retaining a chalice. His face was very truculent, gray and massive, with black cavernous nostrils, and circled by a scanty white fur. There was a heavy odor in the room, the flowers. We blessed ourselves and came away. In the little room downstairs, we found Eliza seated in his armchair in state. I groped my way towards the, my usual chair in the corner while Nanny went to the sideboard and brought out a decanter of sherry and some wine glasses. She set these on the table and invited us to take a little glass of wine. Then, at her sister's bidding, she filled out the sherry into the glasses and passed them to us. She pressed me to take some cream crackers also, but I declined because I thought I would make too much noise eating them. She seemed to be somewhat disappointed at my refusal and went over quietly to the sofa where she sat down beside, uh, behind her sister. No one spoke. We all gazed at the empty fireplace. My aunt waited until Eliza sighed and then said, Ah, well, he's gone to a better world. Eliza sighed again and bowed her head in assent. My aunt fingered the stem of her wine glass before sipping a little. Did he peacefully? she asked. Oh, quite peacefully, ma'am, said Eliza. You couldn't tell when the breath went out of him. He had a beautiful death. God be praised. And everything... Father O'Rourke was in with him a Tuesday and anointed him and prepared him and all. He knew then. He was quite resigned. He looks quite resigned, said my aunt. That's what the woman we had in to wash him said. She said he just looked as if he was asleep. 
he looked that peaceful and resigned. No one would think he'd make such a beautiful corpse. Yes, indeed, said my aunt. She sipped a little more from her glass and said, Well, Miss Flynn, at any rate, it must be a great comfort for you to know that you did all you could for him. You were both very kind to him, I must say. Eliza smoothed over her dress, not uh, smoothed her dress over her knees. Ah, oh, poor James, she said. God knows we done all we could, as poor as we are. We wouldn't see him want anything while he was in it. Nan uh, Nanny had lead, uh, leaned her head against the sofa pillow and seemed about to fall asleep. There's poor Nanny, said Eliza, looking at her. She's wore out. All the work we had, she and me, getting in the woman to wash him and then laying him out and then the coffin and then arranging about the mass in the chapel. Only for Father O'Rourke, I don't know what we would have done uh, at all. It was him brought us all them flowers and them two candlesticks out of the chapel and wrote out the notice for the Freeman's General and took charge of all the papers for the cemetery and poor James's insurance. Wasn't that good of him, said my aunt. Eliza closed her eyes and shook her head slowly. Ah, there's no friends like the old friends, she said. When all is said and done, no friends that a body can trust. Indeed, that's true, said my aunt. And I'm, sh I'm sure now that he's gone to his eternal reward, he won't forget you and all your kindness to him. Ah, poor James, said Eliza. He was no great trouble to us. You wouldn't hear him in the house any more than now. Still, I know he's gone and all to that. It's when it's all over that you'll miss him, said my aunt. I know that, said Eliza. I won't be bringing him in his cup of beef tea any more, nor you, ma'am, sending him any, sending him his snuff. Ah, oh, poor James. She stopped, as if she were communing with the past, and then said shrewdly, Mind you, I noticed there was something queer coming over him latterly. Whenever I'd bring him, bring in his soup to find uh, to him there, I'd find him with his uh, brevery fallen to the floor, lying back in the chair and his mouth open. She laid a finger against her nose and frowned. Then she continued. But still and all, he kept on saying that before the summer was over, he'd go out for a drive one fine day just to see the old house again. Where we were born, where we were all born, down in Irish Town, and take me and Nanny with him, if we could only get one of them newfangled carriages that makes no noise that Father O'Rourke told him about, them with the rheumatic wheels for the day cheap, he said, at he said at Johnny's rushes, um, at Johnny rushes over the way there and drive out the three of us together of a Sunday evening. He had his mind set on that, poor James. The Lord have mercy on his soul, said my aunt. Eliza took out her handkerchief and wiped her eyes with it. Then she put it back again in her pocket and gazed into the empty grate for some time without speaking. He was too scrupulous always, she said. The duties of the priesthood was too much for him, and then his life was, you might say, crossed. Yes, said my aunt. He was a disappointed man. You could see that. A silence took possession of the little room, and under cover of it, I approached the table and tasted my sherry, and then returned quietly to my chair in the corner. Eliza seemed to have fallen into a deep reverie. We waited respectfully for her to break the silence. After a long pause, she said slowly, It was that chalice he broke. That was the beginning of it. Of course, they say it was all right, that it contained nothing, I mean, but still. They say it was the boy's fault. But poor James was so nervous. God be merciful to him. And was that it? said my aunt. I heard something. 
Liza nodded. That affected his mind, she said. After that, he began to mope by himself, talking to no one, and wandering about by himself. So one night, he was wanted to he was wanted for to go on a call, and they couldn't find him anywhere. They looked high up and low down, and still they couldn't see a sight of him anywhere. So then the clerk suggested to try the chapel. So then they got the keys and opened the chapel, and the clerk and Father O'Rourke and another priest that was there brought in a light for to look for him. And what do you think... There he was, sitting up by himself in the dark, in his confession box, wide awake and laughing like softly to himself. She stopped suddenly as if to listen. I too listened, but there was no sound in the house, and I knew that the old priest was lying still in his coffin, as we had seen him, solemn and truculent in death. an idle chalice on his breast. Eliza resumed, wide awake and laughing like to himself. So then, of course, when they saw that, that made them think that there was something gone wrong with him.